Welcome in to another episode of Your Drum Questions Answered, brought to you by Drum Launch Academy. I'm your host, Chris Breedlove. Today's question is this, how can drones, how are drones being used for ocean rescues? So to help me tackle this question this week, I'm really excited to welcome Sean Berry from the town of Oak Island. Sean, thanks for joining the show. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation, Chris. Now, Sean, before we kind of get into that, you know, how are drones being used for ocean rescues, just tell our listeners a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into the position you're in today. So I'm a retired police officer, and then we experienced uh, some significant damage here on our coastal island. And I had, at the time, been flying drones for doing surveying work for roofing contractors and some documenting for realtors. And so presented to the town, the usefulness of the drone, which uh, initiated some talks and being brought in part-time and acquiring some initial equipment. And then we had some just really good use cases with it and just promoted the success of the drone and the town recognized the need for it to be a full-time staff position. And so in 20, early 2024, the position went full-time. And so, you know, being both in the fire service and having law enforcement experience and emergency management experience, it was kind of like an easy transition in. And so we run it as a public safety, the drone operation housed under the fire department, but serves both the police department and the fire department. And then we have some collateral duties, which include any type of drone work that any of our town departments may need, whether it's documentation of projects, you know, events or for social media promotions. So we utilize the drone for multiple different things with primary focuses on public safety. Absolutely. So. From that standpoint, why Oak Island? Like, it feels like you would expect really large cities or like a Wilmington, North Carolina or a Charleston or whatever to be kind of leading the way. But, but yeah, why Oak Island leading this charge? Yeah, you know, well, Wilmington does have their own drone program, which we train together and we operate together as a kind of like a Cape Fear region drone group. And so we do bi-weekly training, but I think Oak Island geographically presents itself by one being an island, but two, the number of people that come and visit the island and then enter into our waters. And they're not really cognizant of rip currents and how weather affects how the waves are going to act or changes in where our sandbars are, which affect current. And so we'll get anywhere from people being out too far to distressed swimmers being caught in rip currents to people trying to cross the tip of the island where they see between Oak Island and Holden Beach, where it's a kind of a shallow area, but the current's quite fast and they think they can cross it and get caught up in it. To people that just go out kayaking and either get lost or don't uh, time the tides and get stuck in the mud and then either try to get out and sink in the mud and face getting cut from all the oyster shells. So we have a wide variety of ocean rescue type calls, whether it's uh, somebody in a boat or a boat being stuck on a sandbar that's getting caught by the rising tides. Or last year we had a gentleman who had Parkinson's and diabetes and went out crabbing in his boat, elderly gentleman, and hadn't been heard from in several hours. And so they were able to launch the drone, find his location, and we can actually see the phone laying on his seat next to him where his wife was trying to call him, but he was so disoriented, he wasn't able to pick it up. So we came back and we attached a tether to the drone and a VHF radio and flew the VHF radio over. And while we were bringing the radio down and in a hover, a neighboring boat that was in the area saw what was going on and came over. And then we were able to release the radio into the boat that came to assist him and establish communications and find out what his condition was. Mm -hmm. And that saved us having to dispatch a bunch of additional assets that weren't necessarily needed at that point. Gotcha. So I guess in essence, then it's just like you said, the geography, Oak Island, the context, and I guess maybe it's fair to say not to put words in your mouth, maybe leadership and the, the town as a, as a government, you know, the citizen buying into, Hey, these are life-saving tools. We don't need to shy away from them or, or anything else or wait for a, a giant city to lead the way. Like Oak Island can lead the way. In this yeah. So, I mean, it, I got to tell you, having a uh, town leadership and the people that are involved from our town manager to our town council, to our chiefs of both police department and fire department, having a hundred percent buy-in on it. They got to witness firsthand how much better we could be prepared and an easier response and a quicker response and enhanced scene safety and scene security is just played. And so by having them behind it, I think that is a key, you know, and our communities bought, bought into it as well. They're fully supportive of it and they can see all the positive things that the drone brings about. We don't have that stigma of the drone being a, a negative thing when it's in the air. We've done so many positive things with our drone and, and celebrated those successes and pushed the information out that we have a really good, kind of like a fan base behind it between both, you know, our, our uh, administration and our community. Yeah. No, that's awesome. In case someone comes across this episode, maybe who's in either police, fire, emergency management, whatever, 
and then maybe they're struggling to get that, to get that buy-in potentially in their local, you know, jurisdiction, I guess, what would you say to someone in that boat of like how they could help tell the story or make the advocacy, whatever the case may be to try to elicit that buy-in, if that question makes sense. Yeah. So we shared a lot of use cases and unfortunately at our time and the purpose is what we were looking for. There wasn't really many to choose from to, so it was a model that we presented and showed them the capabilities, but it was dependent upon having the right equipment that had those capabilities to be able to do the things that we're doing with the drones. And so in recognition of that, that's when they saw, you know, Hey, this is, we have the potential of doing these things. And with that, we went and purchased our new updated equipment. And once we purchased our new updated equipment, our, our capabilities just went through the roof as far as the type of environment that we can fly in, the features that the drone offers the attachments that we can have to it. So last year we got our first, we updated our equipment to an M30T with some additional payload attachments. And it was just maybe a week or two after we got the equipment and the position went full time, just at the end of the day, doing a training mission, just playing with the thermal camera to see how everything worked on that device and ended up locating the body of a missing person that had been missing for over a month. And the, it was located in a body of water. We were able to use a laser, identify the spot, get the GPS coordinates, share it through a QR code that was generated through the drone and disseminated that out to our ground crews because where the individual was located wasn't accessible or visible by somebody just standing in the wood line. So we had to cut our way in. We used the drone to market. We used the drone so camera for, to make some positive identification. It was just immediately recognized that, wow, we really definitely made the right choice. And, and from there on out, it's just been, we hit the road running and we've done so many different things with it. We researched and looked at a bunch of different platforms to use for deployment of personal flotation devices to augment our ocean rescue response. I think that really kind of pushed us forward and it probably into the limelight of Oak Island having this deployment. So in May, we had a, a new device that we trained with and in April with our ocean rescue team. And we saw on social media, this new device that instead of carrying just one of the personal flotation devices in a tether, it would actually hold two and secure it under the belly of the drone, which helped with launching and landing and ease of uh, deploying the device. And so it was three days after we received that device, really didn't get a chance to practice with it much. And we had a uh, ocean rescue call and we were able to have a successful deployment to a distressed swimmer by dropping two of the auto inflating PFDs with their you know, they were kind of being pushed forward and back with the ebb of the, of the tide and the, and the currents. So put, dropped one in front and one in back, and he was able to hang on to that and we were able to retrieve him. How does that, if you want to go with that specific incident or in general, like someone calls on one or I guess that's how this starts. I assume if there's lifeguards on the beach to you get the call, your team gets the call, like walk us through just how that works. And I'm also curious too, like these are aftermarket. How do you control that? What's the flow? What's the, I guess, and the time to respond and then second. How do you actually drop a, an auto inflating PFD in the right spot? Some kind of drop mechanism, I assume. Yes. Yeah, so our, uh, our drone unit is an integral that integrated right into our emergency response through the fire department. So we have a, a vehicle that we respond emergency traffic in, which is lights and sirens, and we can get to the scene of a call. We have certain beach access points that we can gain access to the beach. And then once we're there with the vehicle, we have the, all the equipment kind of organized on the, on the vehicle. So depending on what the mission is, depends on what type of attachment we have to put. So we get dispatched along with everybody else. And so a lot of the times we're out in the field, so we're not specifically at a house or a station or so we can sometimes get there first. And so initially on there. And so what we do is we just, we practice deployment when we practice deploying and attaching an accessory so that we can beat us of the essence, especially if somebody's in a drowning type situation. So we don't want to lag behind on anything. So we do a lot of practicing, a lot of training so that we can deploy very, very efficiently. How that works in deploying the device is we utilize some of the onboard AI features that the drone offers on the M30T is that when the downward gimbal, you'll actually see a set of crosshairs, which is used for identifying your landing spot. We use that as our target acquisition. And so we can place that. And so we can see where it's going to deploy to, and then the mechanism or the attachment has a development software that opens up directly on the controller. And so you can just manipulate it through the controller. It's unfortunate you can't make it like one of the buttons that are on like the back of the drone, like a C1 or a C2, or even the five function button. It has to be, you have to, so you have to kind of take your thumbs off the stick so that you can activate the uh, mechanism. But yep, you can either do one or the other or both at the same time. The delivery device has flashing red and blue light. So it kind of sets us apart. So sometimes we use it just 
even if we're not deploying a payload, just so we can have the different red and blue lights on it. So people can say, Hey, that's a public safety drone. That's just not anybody else flying a drone out here. Right. It comes in peace. It's not someone just leering at people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, we, and we were, uh, our unit, as you can see, we wear a uniform, it's clearly marked. And so we're out there and people are, you know, in our community know what the drone is used for. So back to that, I guess, I think you even said offline as well, this was maybe the first like real world deployment of that particular PFD attachment or, or one of the first? I believe in the United States. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I know definitely for our area, it was the first. And so since then we've had additional deployments with the device. We've had multiple 2024 I believe we had 60 ocean rescue calls. We had 17 saves and I had seven deployments of the PFD in those active rescue situations. So let me ask this question then, like in those stats, like what is the alternatives? And, and I'm thinking also for maybe other beach or I suppose lakefront communities who, who might hear this, like in those seven where it actually got to the point, I'm sure the drone, obviously we'd all know plays other roles, you know, situational awareness, whatever. But when it comes to that, like we launched a PFD from a drone, what's the order of magnitude difference? Like how much longer could it potentially take to get that person a way to float if not for launching it from the drone? So uh, during our training last year, we tested by having a rescue swimmer on the beach and the drone on the beach. And we timed them at the same exact time to get to the patient. And so it was way less than half the time that the drone took to get there and deploy a PFD than it was for a rescue swimmer to deliver, you know, one of their flotation devices that they swim with to the victim half the time. And when you're talking seconds and milliseconds that count in a life-saving near drowning type of environment, any time that's saved is key and beneficial. We don't have lifeguards on our beaches. I mean, so we have 10 miles of shoreline at swim at your own risk, but we do put out quite a bit of information at all our access points. A few years ago, we initiated a rip current warning system. We'll fly flags of different color indicating what the current rip current is. And then every access point has a sign indicating what those colors mean. Every one of our units and our UTVs that we put out on the beach to patrol, they have signs on them as well. And we change the color to the current conditions. And then it really caught on the last few years with a lot of the businesses now flying the colors. And then last year we introduced electronic signs. Some of the very busy access points, there'll be electronic signs that show a color and give you the information on what the current conditions are. The educational access of it has, has helped us reduce the number of instances we've had, but anything that we can do to, when we're called to those types of environments, speed and delivering, and not every type of call, uh, we're delivering a PFD from the drone. You know, we utilize the drone as a marking tool as well, because when somebody's caught in a current or a drift with the waves, it's hard to see. So we utilize the drone as a marker. And we also utilize the speaker system on the drone because a lot of times we get calls and it's notorious that, Hey, there's somebody out too far. We don't know exactly where that mark is, but we get plenty of calls every year that they, somebody just think that somebody on maybe a boogie board or a stand up is out too far. And so we'll dispatch out the drone with a speaker on it and we'll broadcast a message ask them to give us a signal if they're okay. And so we don't have to deploy any additional resources for that. It saved us a lot on not having to deploy assets. Understood. I mean, I guess to your point, if it's seven out of 60, hopefully that number goes lower total because of PR campaigns and signals and so on, but also the actual need of the PFD, the extreme situation hopefully goes down and down, but got to stand ready. Obviously, I mean, that makes make perfect sense. I mean, we're not limited to deploying just PFDs with the drone just because of, we have quite a few options that we can choose from. So we have uh, rescue tubes, which are very similar. Every beach access point has a rescue tube in the event that somebody wants to initiate a rescue, but we can deploy those with the drone. We can deploy a stop to bleed and Narcan with the drone. We have a, a 2.1 pound AED that we've been testing it, the lightest and smallest FDA approved AED on the market. And so we've been uh, a Vive AED is the name of that manufacturer. And so we can deliver that with the drone. So. And there are instances where somebody may be in a, a spot that's not accessible, we can deliver some medical supplies to them. So if we have a cardiac incident on the beach, we can deploy the drone with an AED and get there faster, especially on a really congested beach days where we have high tide or maybe around a holiday, or we have a lot of islands too, that are off our uh, north side of our border in the intercoastal waterway where we have people explore. So if there's happened to be an event out there that we really can't get to that easily, we can deploy stuff out with the drone. Absolutely. So where does the technology go from here. You mentioned the M30T, I guess some of these third-party attachments, but like, do you see drone in a box, you know, dock solutions fitting into some of this stuff? Like where do you see the tech either that's already out or that you would like to see, I guess, on the market? We're now kind of entertaining the idea of having DFR 
a drone in a box type for this type of deployment. But what we realized is not every single deployment is exactly the same. So having a mobile application has been greatly beneficial to our demographics. It all depends on what that mission is and what payload I need to attach to. It's not simply, and we don't look at it simply as the drone, as a flying camera any longer. You know, that's one aspect of it. It is what can the drone attachment do to enhance the drone? And is there a way that we can kind of deliver something if we need to in a life-saving situation? So the same platform to deliver cell phones to barricaded suspects with a long cable lead. So we can, we can lower that down and they can access to it. And that enabled them to establish communications and it ended up peacefully as opposed to a non-peaceful use of force situation. So we've used the drone and its payload capability for so many different things, but DFR is something that we're looking at, but right now it just doesn't fit what we need. Yeah. As far as platforms, uh, we haven't found anything that's comparable and especially in the price point of the platforms that we're utilizing, just because they've worked so well. I mean, it's that drone platform, the, the M30T is specifically made for public safety. There hasn't been anything that can come close to it or near the price point of it. So we've been very happy with that platform and it's allowed us to do the things that we do. Yeah, no, completely understood. I think back to the DFR, you know, drone in a box, it's like, okay, but how do you store it in the box? Do you store it with this attachment or that attachment? Like you said, it's always going to evolve anyway. So at some point, as cool as it is to launch automatically from a dock, you have to get in there and change something out anyway. So maybe it kind yeah, of- because I mean, you know, I may have an ocean rescue call that may not specifically need the PFD, but it may need the speaker. Or we may need the searchlight so that we can, you know, illuminate an area so that we can have additional assets come in. So it all depends. And so we have various different payload attachments to meet the various different types of calls that we have. Yeah. I think we mentioned again, offline, uh, lead a law enforcement drone association. I think I got that right. But could you just tell our listeners what is LIDA and what are they about? What are, what are they doing right now? In the drone yeah, sure. The law enforcement drone association was developed by uh, a couple of public safety professionals that saw the need for an organization to enhance education and training amongst public safety drone pilots. And so they've really taken the helm with steering it and with their training and education and initiatives. I implore every public safety professional to look into the law enforcement drone association for their very advanced training and their skill sets that they have, they offer and the wealth of information that they have available to them too. So just us getting aligned with them, the information and the ability to train is, and has enhanced us and so all these different key holders and these relationships that we foster that allowed our program here in Oak Island to really flourish. We're developing training, we're writing curriculum and we're offering training courses. We've had a really good successful 2025 so far, and we already had several ocean rescue calls and uh, one rescue save under our belt already. So we haven't even entered into our busy season. So we're looking forward to and being prepared for the next season coming up. That's awesome. Sean, again, thank you so much for your time today. We'll make sure to put a link in the show notes to Lita to make it easy for folks listening to this to come across this to, to get right to their information. But yeah, man, again, just thank you. This has been a fascinating discussion. And for our listeners, as always, if you have a question I guess to tackle on this show, please drop me a line at chris at drawwatchacademy.com. Visit ydqa.io or if you're in the Draw Launch Connect community, submit your question there. Until next time, have a great week.